So my name is Robin. Uh, I'm the lead executive officer for uh, Protein Lab at the Design Centre, created by one of you. So today I'm sharing about our biggest space business model in Singapore. Uh, just a disclaimer, I'm not a guru in doing business model or, or actually in fact how uh, business model and who you think is what I write. I'm just sharing uh, for the fact that uh, me, uh, I've seen a few of these biggest businesses in Singapore and uh, personally for the lab itself, uh, I we really had no experience prior to actually running the lab. So I learned it the hard way, so I see uh, how it actually works. But uh, it might not apply to some of the maker spaces because uh, maker spaces are very uh, organic spaces. So you need to revolve around a certain intent. So I'll just share a bit about uh, the one group itself. Yep, so uh, actually, for information, one mail group is actually a consortium of six companies coming together. As you can see, uh, this is actually just an uh, overview of the lake maker, maker landscape in, in Singapore itself. So we did the entrepreneurship and hardware development. We have uh, two companies called uh, Focus Tech Ventures and Smart Space. So basically, Focus Tech Ventures uh, actually is a hardware investing company. So uh, they have investors' interest also in helping some of the makers, uh, hopefully to get them into startups and the products or their products for uh, people to actually go into and buy. So the small space is a co-working space just down the street at Waterloo. Uh, for the more community maker space developer itself, we have a sustainable living lab and also home fix. Uh, so home fix as previously you seen in the earlier introduction. So they have a maker space called XDC, which I'll share about it later. Uh, sustainable living lab uh, we run the first maker space. Uh, although it's currently not in existence right now, uh, I'll still share a bit about that because I actually came from there initially. And we have uh, on the maker events and knowledge partners, uh, Simplified 3D and also Hyperfold Group, which run by the So as you can see, when uh, this maker movement in Singapore is a relatively new concept, and to come as a consultant, we're actually really leveraging on each other's resources and see how we can actually create really an alternative market in, in this uh, sector itself. So yeah, so a, a lot of business model revolve around one thing, that's the market. But in this case, we are really looking into the maker market. Yeah. So what is the maker market? Or oh, well, as far as uh, people know, is there even makers in Singapore? That's one thing. Because on the way we live in Singapore, we don't have spaces really to proactively or people to encourage us to keep on making. Rather, we are really into the sort of education system. You know, the, 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 the saying that if you are here, you know, Go through the path, go study your degree, go get a job, and that's it. So here, uh, even D and T courses are only emphasized during your secondary or during your teens, during the age. So other than that, you know, you really probably have no access. So with regards to the maker market, it's relatively small, and the small this this small market actually is the hardest part to get started in Singapore, and that's why the consortium actually grew together, and, and that depends and varies between each other countries and how you develop this uh, market or is that really existing market that you research on this. So I'll share a bit about some of the scenes that's going on that actually makes up the maker market. So these are actually events. Uh, they are initiated by some of the consortium partners previously before they were coming together as one group. So we have a maker's blog event. Uh, basically the event is like similar to uh, the Maker Fair Carnival in the States. Uh, this is a similar one. Uh, it's actually held at Suntech last year. So the makers blog actually bring together uh, maker enthusiasts, you know, cosplayers, uh, people to do educate, maker education, to share and also you know, basically tell people what they are doing so they get some awareness from them. We um, previously used to host makers meet up very regularly prior uh, to get really to create the community and to really develop the market from there. And this was held uh, every month at several other locations. And this is a good way really to attract the people and to get people who are interested in the maker movement to know more about how to contribute or how you can help the makers movement. And previously last year we had an event at Art Science Museum, this for the Singapore Maker Festival. So these are some of the events. Uh, I've been involved also in the Mini Maker Fair, so US has the uh, big maker fair. So Singapore US a bit small, so we call it Mini Maker Fair. Yeah, so Mini Maker Fair has been ongoing since 2012. Uh, this was actually uh, a, a Sphere created by Science Center itself, and I was involved for me to see me over there bending down. So we, we actually curate booths to give uh, the audience have an experience about making. So in this particular 
uh, year, I'm actually teaching students how to actually kids how to learn about woodworking because uh, it's good to actually start from young. But when it comes to very kid, or not very young kids, the schools or the parents are usually hesitant for them to come near to tools when it's get get hurt, you know, it's get get uh, cuts. So. The, but, but some parents actually say, no, go ahead, let my kids get cut, okay? <laughs> let, let them learn the hard way. But this is a really good way to get them learning in some forms. Eh? So we have a second year at a slightly larger space, right in the middle of town, escape, and later on moving on to the community centre in the St. Jack National CC, where we see more kids today. Eh? So the social media groups, as this market continues to develop, a good way to track uh, who is actually actively in this scene itself is actually using the social media. So we have a few of these groups coming. I realize that most of this group has a certain topic or team. So they are more like geeks, uh, more like electronics related, Arduino related, so there's also 3D printing group related. But the thing is that we have this cluster of group really a lot uh, in Singapore. So I'll, I'll, the, the thing is that how do you get them to come together so that they are able to cross pollinate, collaborate, and continue to grow the community, and continue to grow the market from there. Because with, with several fragmented, uh, clustered market itself, it's very hard for you to basically find a, a point where you can actually have everyone come together and actually blast it out together. So these are just some uh, groups that actually set up in Singapore uh, over the past two years or so. So I'll just share about creative spaces and, and how actually each spaces functions differently. Yeah, so this is actually some of the real life cases uh, at Singapore. So sustainable you that, so as you can see the picture, this is really like a very garage style. Uh, this is at, like at the back of your house or really overseas. So at the back there's a street, you know, there's grass patch to lie down in the sun. So it's quite messy. Yeah, but the commercial is not messy, the probably no one is using it. So actually, it's a good one. So I started from here. Uh, I'll just share a bit about myself also. So I graduated from um, Singapore Polytechnic in interior design. So thereafter, uh, no, when I had it, I didn't have a very pleasant internship experience. So it actually got me thinking. So I was thinking, hey, you know, uh, I'll do something on my own, but I know where to start from. And to think back that you already studied, you know, about three years for your uh, diploma itself, you should have put something to good use, but instead of starting something new. So I actually went on to start my own business, but it wasn't design related, but I said, you know, yeah, that's it, I'm going to start something that I really like. And I, I like design, but to delve deeper into it, I actually like making. Because the sense of fulfillment is something that I, I always uh, like. And you know, it's something that you, it's very hard to get in Singapore. So as I started my own business, I was looking for spaces to actually work. Few spaces that normally you think of is go to school, university, back to where you studied before. You know, ask them to uh, go to the space itself. Say, hey, hey, can I just use it? Well, no, but sadly not okay. So this is the first place that I work out for. So how they work is actually quite, um, quite, I say friendly in some way. So I told them that I had a project that I wanted to pitch, uh, doing uh, for for to get some funding and stuff. So I didn't use the space. I, I didn't have the tools because. I didn't know is it justifiable to, for me to buy the tools itself to do it at home or maybe at home it might be too noisy where my neighbors are just complain. So they actually told me why not we just uh, let in the space to prototype if it really kicks off we can actually work off and collaborate with them. So it's really on a mutual very on a trust basis. And from then on we actually went on to prototype some products to get our own materials. Uh, we actually learned some woodworking techniques using the machines, even supply contacts from there. Uh, thereafter, I eventually also, because the funding didn't work out, I started my own business and I just go full head on that. So a part of my uh, profits from the business itself actually contributed back to the space itself. So in some ways, uh, I'm actually you know, giving back and having a sort of revenue. So this is just uh, a model. So they primarily work on voluntary basis model. Uh, in exchange for using the space, probably every Saturday or Sunday just help clear up the space. So make it clean, make it tidy, so that people, when other people come, no, they are able to. So anyway, but currently this is not in, uh, this is not in place already. Uh, we have sustainably, uh, SL2 has since moved out from the space and joined on the room from there. But there is still a similar space set up over there. Uh, if you are around the way, you can check out, it's actually at Water Tree Park. So next is actually XPC. Uh, XPC actually, you know, one of the consortiums uh, under itself. Uh, they set up a really nice uh, maker space, uh, two floors. Uh, roof of space, we have large space for really big cutting uh, with big machines coming in. So uh, primarily, they are they're focused really on uh, woodworking. They also work on membership models, uh, they have lockers for rental. Uh, right now, more of their classes are moving towards home maintenance, something that is very close to what their core businesses do. So they also conduct classes 
and, and, and uh, yeah, membership itself. So primarily, if you see some of these maker spaces, the base is always membership and classes. Why? Uh, maker classes are actually a very uh, substantial form of business that you can actually recur as long as the content is interesting, as long as the content is uh, reasonable for people to uh, buy, for example. As you can see, in woodworking, there's not much in Singapore really. If you talk about woodworking in Singapore, not many companies are really doing it. So if you are able to identify a gap in the market itself, it's actually you can develop around that gap and create interesting business model. And in this case, for most makers, places, classes is a good way. Uh, when it comes to classes, there are different ways. It could be internal instructors, that could be external instructors. So different models around how you engage the external instructors in terms of uh, you pay, uh, paying back to them for their fees, for example. This uh, I would uh, actually up to the different makers to decide on that way. So it could work even on a other three basis, as I'm saying. So uh, this is actually Co-Foundry. So Co-Foundry is actually a is companies that is a startup uh, for primarily for startups itself. So it's really like co-working space. In some sense, uh, some maker spaces have a very gray line of makers uh, with co-working space. Yeah. And as part of that, because uh, when it comes to making there's also some work to be done and, and, uh, and it boils down really to an environment of the space itself. So this is really primarily focused for startups. And how it works is that they have core programs running schemes that uh, startups, if they are interested, they can sign on. And basically they work with them in terms of mentorship and they go through uh, how the procedure for how the uh, business model will work for them. So this is really a very one-to-one uh, -one basis and a lot of effort needs to be come out from the startup itself. Hackerspace. So Hackerspace uh, actually, uh, they are more electronics focused. Uh, and uh, Arjun and Microsoft Focus. They are, they are a small group of people. Uh, similar to Pro Gaming, there's also spaces like things that uses Arduino and electronics. Actually, you don't need really much space. We really need the, the, the place to house all the tools, right people especially. If you are looking for electronics, you better have someone who's expert in electronics to be there. Yeah. If not, uh, people will come through the door itself. They had questions really a lot about electronics. And this is where uh, they had really a very core group of people who are really electronic enthusiasts and they help people along uh, classes one day, they do programs also with companies, uh, with uh, organizations and schools institutions. So Metalwork is uh, really like an industrial space, uh, function primarily on membership uh, itself. Uh, there are the business models, some of the business models they do, they, they have some products that they sell, they themselves, so they create products to sell. So there are some of the alternative ways of, of looking into how to scale up the business model and uh, make a space itself. Looking into different uh, sources of revenue uh, to actually have it come. So they have relatively big space and uh, they actually, the, the name suggests they actually allow metal works. So for some spaces like uh, the prototyping lab, you can't really do much metal work because the nature of the business is really uh, more commercial instead of the of industrial or building. Uh, this is actually uh, general echo. Uh, I would say this is really a hipster maker space. Yeah. So, as you can see, the, the style, the look, uh, it attracts a certain crowd. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, the end customer using the space is very important. Who are you really attracting? Yeah. If, it, if, if that's the look that you're going, the style, that should be. So, primarily focus, they have all the products by the makers itself displayed at the area. But they have a small mini booth or a small mini session that allow for a small prototyping session. So that affect that also will affect like what's the percentage that you are setting, uh, setting aside for product display, what's the percentage setting aside for classes to be conducted. So they don't do classes like actively uh, a lot of time, they do more pop-ups workshop. So that means either there's a minimum required to sign up, so they you know, probably there's four, then probably that uh, address some of the revenue, uh, the cost issue for them. So you don't need like, hey, if there's one person I still need to conduct, so okay, the cost doesn't really match up. So if you have a minimum required to start the class, you know, that gives you a certain assurance that, hey, uh, this class is going to make at least a certain amount of uh, material cost itself. And then after looking to scale up, you're getting excellent instructors available. So this is one of them. Uh, silicon Strings, uh, similar to Pro Foundry, uh, uh, they have a laser machine there also, uh, basically purely mainly for co-working spaces. So they run on different tiers of membership. So they are basically basic, gold, platinum. So, so when it comes down to membership, you want to go into the details of uh, do you want it to package it simply like ABC or do you want it to package like different tiers of the board? There's a, it's basically a la carte choice of 
for the members to use. So they have a lifetime membership, for example. So it's good always to secure longer term membership, three months membership. Give them a good break. That's a good, uh, I'll say, a form of cash flow for the company. Because having to have membership every month, it's not really, it's just that there's no system in place, like how a gym works. It's really like loan shark going to that okay, in the pay membership, the pay money. Because when it comes to membership for mega space, people don't really see the see the relevance of, hey, I'm going to use this space for like a full month as compared to poor working spaces. So the cost, they need to justify it. And in some cases, it's really very hard for you to uh, help them because it's time management for them. If they are dedicated for a month for membership, but they only come out for like three days. So you can't say who's for that. But the thing is that for here, when we when you have membership, how do you proactively engage people to feel that hey, I I I'm, I'm belong, uh, I feel a sense of belonging to the space. You know? In eventual cases, it might work out that hey, you don't even pay membership. What you need to do right now is actually to help, uh, you know, probably conduct some classes over two or three times over the month. Actually cover some cost for you also for the site. So it, it works very organic, organically in, in bigger spaces. So that's an interesting thing. And, and to have it flexible is something that uh, maker spaces uh, are good at and, and works with a uh, number of resources. Yep, so this is really just uh, my take about this month. It's not gonna be like I'm gonna share about building blocks for makers like the block business model itself because there's no really true solution for business model in maker spaces. Uh, it's really up to the state individual even the intent of the space. Whether is it for entrepreneurial, is it really for education, or is it just for you know, for your own community sake? So there's really a lot of ways to approach. But what I share is in general the creative spaces or the maker spaces in Singapore functions primarily on this basis itself. And if you allow me to, this is just some of the stories of some of the uh, spaces. Uh, the, call, the the key thing about here is creating impact. A lot uh, we have to say. How do maker spaces actually transform people and actually help them realize, hey, I've been wanting to do this for all my life. I, I've come to act differently. That I, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna make a business out of it. Yeah, that's the notion that actually gives people. Because that actually generates an alternative economy. You are creating really a new market for people, for people to write on and for people to pay to go to. And this market is actually very closely related because you have a network of community makers. So just run through some of the few makers that have gone through this space itself and, and things that they have done. So we have Agatha. Probably you've seen her during the lunch later. So she's a upcycling enthusiast. So she does a lot with garments, fashion repair, uh, textile repairs. So uh, later you'll see her doing some t-shirt painting. She'll show you some techniques, uh, simple techniques actually, just using bleach to actually color your shirt. Uh, tomorrow's you know, uh, attire itself, so it looks a bit much more unique. Uh, right now, she also has been looking, because makers are really, uh, she, she should always keep on learning, and she actually picked up electronics. She's learning on uh, wearable technologies using DigiPad itself. So she had conducted workshops, uh, consultancy for some uh, companies, and uh, for the social enterprise, and also NEAs itself. Excuse me. So, Nelson, uh, there's a project downstairs, interesting enough, is a hydrophonics where you see a lot of red and blue lights uh, downstairs when you later go down I look at the night club, but those are actually lights for the plants to grow. Uh, he has actually acquired no knowledge uh, with regards to woodworking electronics, but he himself, he has an inner interest you know, in, in agriculture, uh, and so he pick up 3D printing, electronics, Arduino, and actually this whole system is run by uh, a microcontroller, so it's called the Internet of Things. Everything is actually monitored through your phone itself. And then Leon, Leon, surprisingly, he runs a t shirt uh, sh printing shop uh, just down the road. Uh, but what he actually does is like, experiment with a range of household chemicals and, and produce uh, basically PCB boards and it's customized, customizable. So you will see some PCB printing if you are interested in that later on downstairs. Uh, for t shirt printing, he also be sharing some uh, heat transfer for some of fiber stickers. Uh, these are just some students coming through the space itself. Uh, if you look closely, it's actually a word clock. So you basically need to read to actually know what the time is. So it will tell you that it's 11 past 2 a.m. p.m. Sometimes it will tell you it's your birthday today. So he actually had the IKEA for free and he link up all the electronics and that's how we got it. So the space actually, uh, when it comes to us, he actually had a lot of questions, a lot of doubts on how you can get this. Uh, uh, so friends, uh, colleagues actually help me a lot. 
uh, with understanding uh, some of the algebra, how it works, and some of the prototyping skills. So, Yi Hui was, uh, she was, she's part of a company called Sketch Post. I don't know if you know, they basically draw for doodles for companies. And yep, she she working on this project, it's uh, a wearable technology, it's a retractable dress. Uh, progress. So, she has been taught uh, learning how to use the electronics, how you to apply what she has or what her interest is into what she has to do. And this is just one more. So, I was uh, just looking on the glove, cyclist, uh, basically for cyclist safety itself. And she has really completed a few of this proof of concept uh, at the lab itself. And she actually went on to get a pitch for an idea, a pitch for investment for companies. So far, it's a good mess up. Uh, we set up this business and the space itself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is just one of case. So, yeah, this is just him. Uh, he was actually here on the final year project. You will see a lot of people coming through your doors telling you, hey, you know, I just need to do one project. And probably it's like my final year project. <laughs> and then you say, okay, I'm going to help you. Uh, later on, you see them, if they are interested, they actually went on to do some of their own stuff. So you see the one picture on the right, he actually do up his own Lego shop. That's really quite big. So you learn, uh, yes, you learn some CIC machining, uh, cutting. Actually, you cannot see there are some like basically building blocks that you actually house it, so the thing will uh, fall. Yep. So this is just uh, my take. Uh, I'm not sure how useful it is, but uh, in general, this is really the business model uh, in Singapore. And it's growing. Uh, business model is ever changing. So I'll now open the questions to the floor. If you have any questions, uh, still got some time. Yeah, three minutes for any questions. Uh, I hope I can answer to my best of my abilities. Yeah, any questions? Yes. For for the spaces. Yeah. So uh, making makeup to maker spaces uh, is really a huge capital investment. You realize we need a lot of money for machines, the amount of tools, and especially space. Yeah, in Singapore space is really very expensive. So thankfully for the space at uh, uh, Romeo Group itself, uh, it's actually supported by the government, so it's essentially funded. Uh, and but most of this space, I would say, is really out from your own pocket. Yeah. And, and to justify some of this funding, you probably need to do probably like a P and L sheet to justify how much how much you're generating for each machine. It's a good way to keep track of. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, which of these uh, space is the most sustainable or profitable? Oh, sustainable? <laughs> That's a good question. So, uh, currently all of the maker spaces, I won't say it's sustainable as of yet, because the market is still developing in Singapore. So there is no, I, I can't really justify for a, a sustainable maker space, but we are actually proactive. But the thing is that having, uh, because I have I can operate the maker space and uh, go down quite some time, the thing is that, Creating systems, that's the key thing to actually sustain the model. If you have do you don't have a system for classes, for example, you every time you need to find instructors, you have to create new content, it's not really scalable. If you have a system in place to actually call for propose, uh, call for instructors, a fixed set of content that can be done by anyone, a handbook or guidebook, that is one way that the business could be sustainable. But that to say, primarily, I would say membership is definitely won't be the core of the business model for most of the businesses. Membership are just there to really grow the community because the price fluctuates and it really is very price dependent in some cases. Uh, and when it comes to maker spaces, workshops and things, you know, Singapore is actually not very receptive to making. Yeah, they more receptive just sitting down and just see. So it doesn't really justify. So there are really a lot of other ways. Like I can just bring up a few examples, more examples. So we do work with companies uh, to work on corporate programs. We have shared that uh, programs going around making and these sessions. Normally, if you can, try to please like work two deals of this every month consistently. This is something new, and, and for companies that require, that want to know more about this kind of technology for them, could you provide them with technical training, onboard training for their staff? Yeah, that's one thing. And you keep it consistent. Like every one month or every two months, they probably change their staff. Could you get them to onboard train the level, train the team? That is some form of sustainable. But that to say, uh, it might or might not work. Yeah. So that's all I'm sure. Okay. Uh, can you share some business models or systems that didn't work? I didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> didn't work. So, okay, maybe I share from the prototyping lab experience itself. Yeah. So, uh, we thought that memberships uh, will be a good consistent form of revenue because you know, it is a way to reach out to get people. It's only about getting people. But the thing is that 
you want people to pay consistently. If it's just a one-time one, it's very transactional. And for makerspaces, if, it, if it's being looked upon as very transactional, right, the atmosphere of the street actually dies down. You don't have the vibe to actually attract a lot of people coming in. So the key thing right now here is with system and uh, things in place, how do you keep the space not transactional, but continue on generating revenue in a certain way? So uh, a good form of uh, now some form of revenue, actually sustainable models are really like uh, you can explore uh, events that are you know, together with the organization together and stuff. So we run like hackathons events that are pretty good source of revenue, but it, it needs a lot of uh, man hour to it. So I don't really have a, I don't, I don't know if that's the answer they're looking for, but uh, I don't really have a true answer to that. That's just my take on the, the sustainable model itself. Yeah. So yep, and Last questions. Yeah, one last question. Yeah. Um, so that you get like money and grants and all that. So are the makerspace for profit or not for profit? Okay, so for okay, it, it, it is actually depends for the intention of makerspace itself. So for the uh, prototyping lab, we are actually a private company. Yeah. And uh, we are really looking and as you can see with the skill that we're going, even going globally, we really look into Funding is one way, but you, the primary thing is that people always tell me don't rely just on funding. Yeah, uh, create more more systems, more models, uh, and, and that's a good way to actually scale up. Because if you just rely on funding, what happens is the funding go up. That that means that the bigger space won't uh, survive. So a lot of mega spaces actually revolve around starting with just a community first, self-sustaining to some extent. Yeah, and once they have grown the community. How do you actually work together with the community to collaborate to actually grow the maker space and actually develop more revenues coming? So uh, I would say, yeah, one thing about maker space is that we really need a lot of investment. <laughs> so funding is actually uh, a godsend for us so that in that case, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah. If you want, if you need to find me, I'll be at uh, downstairs at Golden Lab. Uh, I can see the speech later. It's quite easy. <laughs> okay, so thank you.